you will, take your Bibles and go to the book of Genesis as we continue our series in the book of Beginnings. We're going to be looking at a very special date in the history of mankind. You know, some dates, you ever heard of red letter days? When you get your calendar, there are certain days that are red letter days, like Christmas is a red letter day. That's a special day. And uh, I thought I'd test your knowledge of special dates. We're going to put some dates up here. Now, what happened on July 4th, 1776? Signing of the Declaration of Independence, right? How about April 15, 1912? Sinking of the Titanic. We talked about that last Sunday. As the ark is the unsinkable ship, the Titanic was supposed to be, but that's all it ever did was sink. December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. November 22, 1963. Now it's my 12th birthday. That was a red letter day. It was also the day Kennedy was assassinated, but uh, y'all write that down. November 22nd is the pastor's birthday. Write it down, Alex, come on. Now the next one, February 17th, 2348 B.C. Actually, we got it wrong. It was more than 234 B.C. It's 2348 2348 B.C. Now, we just, every February, we celebrate this great day, but it's never mentioned in the news. It's never in the newspaper. Very few people really know the significance of this day. But this day we're going to talk about, that's when it began to rain. And God sent a flood upon the earth in the days of Noah. Now, February 17th, I looked it up. There's, there's other times when that was a significant day. Back in 1776, on February 17th, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire was published. Maybe y'all remember that? On 2-17-1876, the first ship passed through the Suez Canal. On 2-17-1889, Billy Sunday made his first appearance as an evangelist in Chicago. On 2 17, 1908, Geronimo died. All you Native Americans knew that, right? But we're going to talk about 2 17, 2348 BC. On that day, God began to bring a judgment that rained down upon this world. You stand with me. We're going to read selected verses out of Genesis chapter 7. I'm going to cover the whole chapter, but let me give you the highlights in our opening reading here. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house unto the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Verse 7 says, And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Verse 10, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. Verse 12 says, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Verse 17, And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And then verse 23, And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping things and the fowl of the heaven. And they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. So here we read about the divine judgment that came upon this earth back in the days of Noah. Amen. You may be seated. 
Now, I'm going to bring a message today that's not popular. I understand this going in. A lot of preachers today never preach about the judgment of God because they think that's negative and people don't want to hear about that. All they want to hear about is that God is a God of love and mercy and forgiveness, and He is. And I like to preach on that. But folks, we cannot ignore what the Bible says concerning the fact that God is a God of wrath. He is a God of judgment. He is a God of vindication. A recent Barna survey asking people what they believed about God. Do they believe that God exists and what kind of a God is He? Nine out of ten surveyed believe God exists. But many of them, when questioned, the God they believe in is not the God of the Bible. The God they talk about is not the God that has revealed Himself to us in the Scriptures. Let me share some verses with you by way of introduction. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 10. You might want to jot these down in your outline. Jeremiah 10, 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide His indignation. How about Nahum? Chapter 1, verse 2. It says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth and the Lord revenge and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. That's in the Bible, isn't it? Now, why is it that people refuse to accept what the Bible says about the judgment of God, that he is a God of judgment, that he is a God of wrath, when he clearly revealed to us this is true of him? We ignore this to our own peril because we need to know there's a judgment day coming. God is going to judge men and sentence them for all eternity. Now, the great flood of Noah's time reveals to us this side of God that He is a God of judgment. But first of all, let's think about the patience of God. The patience of God that was exhausted. Back in the days of Noah. Let me give you some other verses that, that deal with this. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. It says, The Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. We say amen to that, don't we? Amen. God is patient and gracious and long-suffering. Boy, we need that, don't we? How about Numbers 14, 18? says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty. Got to add that too, don't we? Let me give you one more. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Amen. I, I thank God He is. I thank God that He is long-suffering and patient and slow to anger. When we think about God's patience, first of all, we see that God's patience is long. Now, in the story of Noah and the ark, that scene, isn't it? We see that the long-suffering of God is evident. Remember Methuselah? Remember that when he was born... He was given this name Methuselah, and it means when he dies, it shall come. That was a prophecy. When Methuselah dies, what shall come? The flood, the judgment of God will come. How do you see the long-suffering of God in this? In the fact that Methuselah lived longer than anybody in recorded history. God waited, and he waited, and he waited for man to repent. He waited for man to come back to God. And you see the long-suffering of God 
in the fact that he allowed Methuselah to live longer than anyone has ever lived, showing his patience with man. And then through Noah, for several decades, Noah preached judgment is coming. God is providing an ark of safety for those, if you enter in, you'll be saved from judgment. And God waited and waited and waited as Noah preached this message, but nobody would abide. Nobody would heed the message. But you see how long-suffering that our God is. Hebrews eleven seven says, By faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. When God warned Noah, he listened, and he got on the ark. It goes on to say, 2 Peter 2, 5, that God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So the long life of Methuselah and the many years of Noah's preaching, don't they reveal the patience of God? That he is long-suffering to us. Now in Genesis chapter 7, look at verse 4. And yet seven days, he puts Noah and his family in the ark, and he still waits seven days before it starts to rain. God, folks, God is reluctant to judge mankind. God is not willing that any should perish. He waits another week, hoping man will repent. Noah and his family sitting there on that ark, seven days. And I'm sure all their friends and neighbors are taunting them, sitting in that ark for seven days. But then it begins to rain. I, I, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad that God is not as impatient as I am. Y'all pray for me. I, I'm impatient. I hate waiting in line. Me and Betty have a lot of d debates about this. She likes to go to restaurants that have a, a mile-long line waiting to get a, a table. To her, that's, that's significant. That this is a good place to eat because so many people are trying to get in. I'd rather go get a hamburger where I can just get it right then and be out. I hate waiting in line. Are you like that? Anybody like that? I'm impatient. I'm so I'm glad God's not like me. You are too, aren't you? I'm, I probably get the most amens out of that. I heard about a guy who prided himself in being punctual. He followed a, a precise routine every day. His alarm went off at 6.30 a.m. He arose briskly, shaved, showered, ate breakfast, brushed his teeth, picked up his briefcase, got in his car, drove to the ferry landing, rode the ferry to the business area. He walked to the building, rode the elevator to the 17th floor, sat down at his desk precisely at 8 o'clock. Without fail, every day for eight years, he followed that routine. Then one morning, his alarm failed to go off. He overslept for 15 minutes. He was panic-stricken as he rushed through his shower, nicked himself shaving, gulped down his breakfast, jumped into his car, and sped to the ferry landing, ran to the dock, and there was the ferry, just a few feet from the dock. He ran with all of his might and leaped as far as he could and landed on the deck of that ferry. The captain said, man, that was a tremendous leap. But, sir, if you just waited another minute, we would have reached the dock and you could have just walked on. <laughs> he thought it was going, it's coming. So we're not very patient at times, but 
Hey, thank God today that he is a patient God, that he is a long-suffering God. But while his patience is long, folks, secondly, his patience is limited. His patience is limited. It says that God will not strive with man continually. That word strive means to plead with. God will do everything he can to save man, to save man from judgment. But folks, there is a point when God through his Holy Spirit will strive no longer with man. Do you know God will give up on a man? The Bible says so. Romans 1, 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. God will give you up. See, you can say no to God over and over and over again, and finally you say no once too often, and God gives you up. So what does that mean? It means that God's Holy Spirit will not strive with you any longer. He will not plead with you any longer. And when the Holy Spirit gives you up, you're done. Folks, nobody can be saved unless the Holy Spirit is working on him, convicting him and trying to draw him to Christ. That's why we should pray for the lost. One thing we can pray for is that God will not give up on them, that God will continue to deal with them until they are saved. So we think about the patience of God. Secondly, think about the wrath of God. The wrath of God that was exhibited. Go back to verse 10, Genesis 7. Came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, that's why I call it February 17th, same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. So February 17, 2348 B.C., it began to rain. Now I know that the sec second month of the 17th day of Noah's calendar does not match our calendar. I understand that. Later on, Israel would adopt a lunar calendar. And the dates that you find in the Bible are based upon a lunar calendar. And I'm sure that's what Moses was going by, which would have put this date either late March or early April by their calendar. But for our sake, we'll just say February 17th. Can we do that? I'm preaching, we'll do it anyway. Judgment came on that day. It came in the form of a universal flood. Two things here. We see the opening of the windows of heaven here. I believe God caused a canopy of water that surrounded the earth to collapse and flood the earth on this time. According to Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, we read about the water that was suspended around the earth. Many believe that there was a canopy of water that surrounded the earth and it kind of provided a greenhouse effect upon the earth. And the earth did not experience bitter cold winters or hot summers back then. It was a constant, pleasant temperature year-round. Things changed when God allowed that canopy of water to collapse, which helped flood this world. Now, I know a lot of people reject Bible stories like this about the flood. There are some people who just cannot believe in the supernatural. They say they believe in a God, but the God they believe in is weak and cannot do anything supernatural. Now, folks, what good is a God like that? Hey, my God is not weak. My God can do the miraculous. My God can do the supernatural. My God can do anything. He established the laws of nature, and my friend, he can suspend those laws anytime he wants to. Nothing's too hard for God. Now, if you want to believe in a puny God that can't do anything supernatural, go ahead. But I want to remind you, 
The God you're going to face on Judgment Day is not that puny God you believe in. It's going to be this God of the Bible. Amen. That's the God you're going to face. And He is, the God, he is an all-powerful God. He is an omnipotent God. There's nothing He cannot do. The opening of the windows of heaven and the outpouring of the wrath of heaven. Genesis chapter 7, look at verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, bowl of fowl and cattle and beast and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils were the breath of life. Of all that was in the dry land, died. And every living substance was destroyed which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and creeping thing and fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. Here you see the outpouring of the wrath of God. God spared not the old world. The flood reminds us, folks, of the severity of God's wrath. Remember Nahum 1 2? Said the Lord revengeth and is furious. You ever think of God that way? That God is furious with sin and will take vengeance on his adversary and reserves wrath for his enemies, those who reject him and will not obey his commandments. Folks, it's vital that we face the truth concerning the wrath of God against sin. Listen, one day every person has got to die. And every one of us is going to have to face God. We can be in Christ and have forgiveness, or we can die without Christ and we'll face His wrath. Can you imagine no one his family are in the ark and men and women are banging on the ark and saying, Noah, Noah, let us in. Let us in. Do you know Noah could not let them in? Do you know why? The Bible says God shut the door and God sealed it. Noah couldn't open the door if he wanted to. Only God could open that door. Now, folks, listen. There's a door of salvation. God, it's open right now. That door of salvation is open. But one day it's going to be shut. And no man will be able to open it. Hey, you can't pray your loved ones out of purgatory because there's no purgatory in the first place. You can't pray your loved ones out of heaven. You cannot open that door. That is a door that God can open and God will shut. And if you die without Christ, that door is shut forever. Hey, there's no second chance after death. The outpouring of the wrath of God. Many were rushing to higher ground, trying to get away from the rising waters. One by one, they perished. We read of a future day similar to this. Go to Revelation chapter 6 with me. The book of Revelation, chapter 6, beginning with verse 14. Now, this is talking about the great tribulation period where once again the wrath of God is going to be poured out upon a sin-cursed, Christ-rejecting world. Look, look what it says here, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, from the wrath of the Lamb. See, here's the wrath of God again being poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. 
And when this happens, it's going to be too late. Folks, the Bible makes very clear that one day, God's going to divide the sheep from the goats. There's going to be a reward for the righteous, and there's going to be retribution on the unrighteous. And if you die without Christ, you're unrighteous. I don't care how good you think you are. If you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a sinner under condemnation. And you're facing the wrath of God. Then finally, let's note the grace of God. The grace of God that was experienced by one family all died upon the earth except for Noah and his family that were on the ark. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You know what? Dwight's found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Can you put your name there? For by grace are you saved. Through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. I found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I've been saved by the grace of God. Noah experienced the saving grace of God in his life. He's called a just man, perfect in his generation, and walked with God. I, I told you. When it says that he was a just man, it just means he was saved. He was a justified man. You're looking at a justified man. I'm a just man. I've been justified by my faith in Jesus Christ. It's not my righteousness I'm trusting in. It's his righteousness that has been given to me. We're justified before God because of faith, and we accept the promise salvation. You know, all the way back with Adam and Eve, God promised a Redeemer would come. The seed of the woman shall come and bruise the head of the serpent. Noah believed in that promise. Noah believed that there was coming a Redeemer that would put away his sin, and that's what he trusted in. Let me remind you, everybody from Adam until today were saved the same way. There's not a different way of saving folks back in the Old Testament. Now, you might hear some say, well, they were saved by keeping the law and offering sacrifices. No, they weren't. They were saved by grace through faith. So how could that be? Simply that their faith looked to the future. Like Noah, they believed that the Messiah would come and redeem them from sin. Our faith looks back. We look back to that day when Christ did die on the cross to put away our sin. Just as they were looking for the first coming of Christ, hey, aren't we today looking for the second coming of Christ? By faith, we believe Jesus is coming back. Same thing. The Old Testament person believed by faith Christ was coming. By faith, we believe he's coming again. Our faith looks to the future. It's always been by grace, through faith, that we are saved. There's only been one way of salvation. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hey, have you? Have you found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Have you exercised faith in his Messiah? And we see, secondly, Noah experienced the sheltering grace of God. Look at Genesis 7:23. Noah and his family remained alive. It said, Noah only remained alive, and they that were in him, with him in the ark. They were spared from the wrath of judgment. They were sheltered from the wrath of God. Again, 2 Peter 2, 5. And God spared not the old world. But save Noah, the eighth person. Eighth person means he was the eighth generation from Adam. A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Why did God save Noah? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Folks, if we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, 
What that means, about 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to a cross on Calvary. While he was nailed to that cross, God took every sin I'll ever commit and laid them on Jesus. And every sin you've ever committed or ever will commit was laid upon Jesus. And folks, listen to me. The wrath of God was poured out upon Jesus. He suffered the wrath of God. God turned his back on him. He cried out, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken. He became the curse of sin. And he suffered the wrath of God in my place and in your place. Now, because he did that, I don't have to suffer the wrath of God. He did that for me. Because I've trusted in him and accepted him as my Savior, I can escape the wrath of God. That's the good news. Folks, that's the good news we need to be sharing with everybody. Judgment's coming, but if you accept Christ as Savior, that judgment will not fall upon you. Hey, you'll never be judged for your sins. You know that? Don't think that on judgment day you're going to be judged for your sin because you're not. Amen. You know why? Because Christ has already suffered that judgment. Christ was judged for your sin. You're gonna, your, your life will be examined to see if you get any rewards on judgment day. But you'll not be judged for your sin. Christ already paid for that. Hey, isn't that great news? Back during the days of the pioneers, there was a wagon train that was crossing the prairie. The wagon master noticed a huge cloud of smoke several miles away, and it was a, it was a prairie fire, and it was coming right at them. The wind was blowing it right at that wagon train. And it would be upon them in just a matter of minutes. He knew he could not outrun it. What he did is he went back behind the wagon train and set the grass on fire behind them, and the wind took it away from them. Then he circled the wagons back to that burnt portion, and when the fire got to them, it could not burn what was already burnt. They were safe, being on the ground that was already burnt. Now, folks, what I'm saying is, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's already experienced the fiery wrath of God. And by being in Christ, you come to the place where judgment has already fallen and cannot fall again. Does that make sense? It did to me, that's why I put it in here. But seriously, folks, the wrath of God is severe. It's going to come upon every nation in the great tribulation. It's going to come upon every person who's left behind. Let me remind you, your only escape is Jesus Christ. He is that ark of safety. If you get in Christ, you're safe from the judgment to come. The lost friend, if you refuse Jesus Christ, the beloved Son of God, you're going to face the God who sent His Son to die for you. And if you refuse Him, you will suffer the horrible wrath of God. And Christ is the only Savior that we have. There's not many ways of salvation. There's only one. And it is through the Lord Jesus Christ.